Hey, Ansi, how are you doing? Hello, I'm very good, thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for being my guest. It's a pleasure to have a, such a big uh, personality from the metal community. Um, for who doesn't know who you are, I think that the most of people knows, because if they doesn't know, it's a bit weird, <laughs> since you have been uh, doing so much work for, for example, with Children of Bodom, and uh, you are behind uh, the album that won a gold and platinum. So you are the owner and record producer from Astia Studio. Um, and uh, next year, in one year, is going to be the 30th anniversary of the studio. So- Has it already been so long? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, are you going to um, uh, to celebrate somehow? Are you going to do something special for the 30th? Yes, we, we have special events throughout the year because 30 years, it's uh, unbelievable. Time, time flies. And yeah. yeah, there will be videos and there will be uh, celebration at the, uh, at the studio. And yeah, lots of cool stuff coming. Nice. And uh, talking about uh, the studio, uh, uh, you in particular are you are doing the analogic recording. You are specialized, and uh, now nowadays uh, the, there are not many bands that are using the an analogic. But yeah, when you listen to a album or a song that uh, was recorded with analogic it's it's different it, you can feel uh, that there is something more there is something more but um why uh, i mean i was thinking yeah it's clear why you prefer the analogic recording but uh, uh, when did you decide that you want to do mostly analogic um, when I started back in uh, 93, when I started recording, I was recording on the analog using tape machine. And uh, slowly or gra gradually I moved to digital uh, tape and then to dig digital audio workstation door, meaning recording on the computer. And for at least a de decade or so, I was wondering what's wrong with me? Why music doesn't touch me? like it used to touch me and then i then i thought that it's just the, the fault was on me or within me and uh later on when i started to do a simple a b comparison i started to compare uh mixing on the digital then mixing uh, having the same mix on the analog mixing console like the one behind me the trident vector 432 and when it was mixed through an analog mixing console to me, it sounded a lot better. Then I started showing people the results and it, everyone was, was like, yeah, there, there is a difference. And then I started experimenting with tape machines and I noticed that it sounded a lot better. There was more information. And yeah, eventually that led to the point that in 2017, I quit uh, recording on the digital. And after that, I no longer accept any files for mixing and I'm doing full analog sessions only and yeah uh, with magnetic tape the analog recording i found out that the fault was not it was not my fault that the music didn't touch me because now i feel the same joy which i felt when i was a teenager and when i first started listening to music and when, when music touched me i have the same same emotions still it was uh, just a, a question of a format yeah and uh, I think that uh, on the website of uh, Astia Studio, there is a lot of information about the studio. And uh, also you have the blog with a lot of advices uh, and it's, a, it's really well done with case studies and so on. I have been reading, they, they are really interesting for me that I know nothing about studio. So <laughs> it was like uh, very interesting, but. Yeah, I have been, uh, uh, so for what I remember now in the in the last years, uh, 
I have listened to Serpico album and then to the Vanguardian EP and uh, yeah, they, they are good. The sound is good and uh, you feel the emotion. You feel uh, what the the musician wants to bring out. So that's that's something I, I was, uh, you know, yesterday or the day before, maybe the day before I was uh, re-watching an interview that I did with uh, Leather Leone. And uh, there was a part when she was, I asked about uh, the differences between uh, the metal music uh, in the 80s and nowadays. And she was telling, yeah, that she doesn't, uh, she doesn't enjoy the, nowadays the digital recording uh, she's she doesn't like this uh, perfection things uh, she miss all the all the sounds of the mouth all of the guitar that are missing that that's something that is like live so yeah it's uh, i understand uh, what she mean because it's really different uh, um how many band uh, so far have been there uh, doing the analog recording with you i've, I've lost count uh <laughs> most many. of them are mentioned at the astia studio website but uh, i would say dozens and dozens and dozens uh mostly it's like when when a band comes for an analog recording session they come back so there are many bands who have been doing like 10 plus recordings with me like 10 plus sessions already since 2017. And that's something that bands also tend to get hooked on. Yeah. Also, I have read that uh, normally the drum record, the drums are recorded in uh, one session from the beginning to the end, but other instrument can be done in, in a different way. Can you explain uh, why? Yes, uh, when when you record on the digital, you usually record everything separately, and uh, everything you hear, all, all the all the recording, is usually done in small pieces because the perfection is what people seek. And exactly as you mentioned, that when the human is edited away from music, then it becomes too clinical. It becomes too clean. It's like there's no taste, there's no smell, there's no, no feel of danger. And when you record on the uh, magnetic tape, when you record on the analog, uh, there's the feel of danger. Like we need to decide, is this good enough take? Is it good enough when it comes to technique compared to the emotion? And uh, we could also record drums in small pieces, but usually the schedule is so that we just record it from beginning to end. It's like, like a live show you usually don't see uh, at the live show that band will only play the intro then they will take a coffee break and then they, they will play the verse and so on they usually play it from beginning to end and that's the point with the uh, music in general and especially on analog recording uh, other instruments can be played on small parts if it's needed usually it's not needed because once you get the musician to the correct state of mind and you get the energy going and like all the stuff flowing, then uh, they do the best take and it, it would be like one to three takes is the optimum. Then the next 10 takes will be something completely different, usually unusable stuff. So it, it kind of comes in waves. So I do my best to capture the best energy. You, sometimes it's the whole band recorded at the same time, but the point for other instrument except for drums to be recorded in small pieces is that we have a solid drum track so then we, we can uh, press record at any any point in the song but with the drums it's usually like we need to play it from beginning to end especially as i recommend not using a click track because click track makes the drummer a slave and you can't be an animal when when you are a slave yeah also, I think it's the, the point is that um, if an album sounds in a certain way and it's done uh, digitally, then they, the band are going to play live and they are never going to sound like in the album. Exactly. When, uh, the, the analog 
is is the other way that it sounds like they are because I just again I'm saying again that Vanguardian because I was so impressed with their performance and I didn't listen uh, that much to their music before so I was impressed and then when I listened to the to the hippie and it was like yeah they sounds like the same there is not difference so that that that's a big thing and I think it's an important thing uh, because I, I love to go to see live music and to enjoy. And uh, I like to see the the, the band uh, being uh, um, full of energy on the stage uh, and still sounding uh, like, like the album. But uh, uh, what... Uh, What's the most tricky part uh, of uh, recording in an analog way? Um, that's a very good question. Personally, to me, when it comes to kind of the process of recording, I don't see much difference in recording on the digital or on the analog. Because uh, when, as a sound pro producer or, or the kind of music producer, uh, my goal is to get the musician or the whole band when they are playing live together in the same room to get them as comfortable as possible and give them the courage to jump off a cliff in a way so kind of like uh jump into the unknown and just let the magic happen and then it doesn't matter which medium you are recording to but then of course that matters in the how it's going to sound like what is going to be captured of that moment which we have created so in that sense uh, i don't see any any um kind of tricky parts or difficult parts maybe the tricky part would be to have all the pieces of equipment working together because we are talking about mechanical stuff and it's not software but then again on the software side, there is even more problems to make make them work together. But yeah, I, I, I like that in a way, this mad scientist thing when you have lots of physical equipment, hardware, and you need to make it work. Yeah. And let's go back when you start working as a, a record producer uh, or way before. Um, did you know be, before starting, did you know that you want to become a record produce, producer? Uh, do you know what you want to do? do, do did you know that you want uh, your own uh, studio? Or tell us more about this because I'm curious. Uh, I did, didn't know. Uh, I started playing the violin when I was five years old and then I took a little break from music and at the, at the age of nine I started my first rock band and uh, I, I recall I was on maybe around fifth or sixth grade uh, in, in school and I, was, I, I remember thinking that it would be so cool to be a musician and to be able to make this album uh, in this style and the next album completely different style and then I was wondering but how can you make it when you're a musician you you need to kind of stick to at least try to stick within one genre of music and uh, I got my first recording equipment when I was like maybe 16 year, years old and my point was to start recording my own songs with with the bands and musicians who I was uh, having fun with and uh, all of a sudden, as in, in my hometown, Lappeen Ranta, we didn't have any recording studio, no demo studio, anything like that. And when the local bands heard that now at the bomb shelter of a church, yes, that was our rehearsal place, and that was the start place of Astia Studio, that there was a recording equipment available. So the local band started contacting me, and all of a sudden I had like months of line waiting like every local band wanted to come and do the recording with me so uh, and when i was doing the demo demos for them uh i, I started giving them suggestions like hey the, it would be so cool that if we put this vocal harmony there and can can we can we change the drum beat a little bit in this part and 
when the idea started coming and the bands were completely blown away like hey that that's a very good idea so it kind of eventually i learned that i have the ear so just kind of to give a suggestion which 99.99 percent of time uh works yeah so let's say that you are like a painter that uh, give colors to to the to the band sounds I like to see in this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But cool. uh, uh, how many instruments uh, are you able to play? Uh, I started with, uh, after, the, after the violin, I started with bass guitar, then I upgraded to guitar. And actually I play a couple of guitar parts on Children of Bodom albums, like on Hate Breeder, the title track, there is the Break Horus with the, the melody line and I, I play the harmony guitar on there and also on one song me and Alex Laiho play kind of first I, I play a solo and then then he plays a solo and uh, I also play keyboards on Teras Betoni Taivas Lyotulta song for example and a couple of others as well and on some songs I, do, I, I, I can confess that I, I have been singing back backup vocals as well. Nice. But, uh, that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite instrument? It it depends a little bit. Usually it's the bass because I I think when the bass is glued to the drums, then we can create magic. But if the bass is kind of a bit too loose from the drums, then you can't build on on such foundation. So playing bass, I think, is is my most favorite. Yeah. Uh, on March, I played bass on Nikki Liljestrand's debut album, for example, with Tony Pannanen on drums. Yeah, nice. And what bass do you own? Uh, I have Warwick five-string thump bass. Okay. And some, sometimes we at the recording we can use that one, or the band can bring their bass, which, for example, Nikki brought a very nice, was it maybe from the 70s, some Fender jazz bass, but then uh, after doing the tests, we ended up using Barvik on his album because it it just fit the album, atmosphere of the album better. Yeah, yeah, because of course every every bass has its own sounds, and you have to have the right one to the that glue with everything else. And uh, exactly is a finger style. Usually with pick, but uh, recently I've been more going back to the playing playing with fingers only without the pick. It there is something more, I don't know, something translates better without a pick. Yeah, it's well with the pick is more metallic the sound. So yeah, I I personally when I see on the stage a good bass player that use all the proper techniques and there is uh, this groove. Oh, it's uh, it's like the be the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy. Yeah. Do, do you play an instrument? Well, uh, I I I cannot say that I play because I have been uh, I put like uh, the bass uh, on the side a bit uh, because when I moved to Finland, I. I leave my basses. I have in Italy. I have to, I, at some point, maybe next summer, I can bring them to Finland after 11 years. But yeah, uh, I have a one uh, uh, Fender Jet and uh, then I have uh, uh, Jim Reed and made a five string. Um, Whoa. And now here I have an acoustic bass, but it's it's not the same as the electric. <laughs> yeah. So I have I haven't been playing that much. And uh, every every day I promise myself that today I'm going to play a bit just to, to keep to keep the finger <laughs> framed. But yeah, uh bass is my favorite. I actually in the past I played the the flute, the the, the one on the side. Um, I have one here, but it's been a while that. So I have two different instruments: the high note and the low note. 
So two different things, really different, but uh, I would like to be able to play much more things, but I don't, I, I know that I, I'm not able to play drums because I don't think that I have that coordination <laughs> to do it. Uh, but yeah, it will be nice to be able to play more. And then I, I, I'm not really a good singer. Uh, I'm not a singer at all. <laughs> so it's better if someone is uh, in a bar when I'm singing karaoke, it's better to cover the, the ear and protect because <laughs> it's tragic. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we can make both do a New Year's promise to play more instruments. Yeah. In 2024. It's, it's a good thing to do. <laughs> Let's promise for the new year to be to be more active in playing. But sounds uh, like a plan. Uh, yeah, it's a good plan. <laughs> but let's get back to to children of bottom because you have been uh, a big part for for them. Uh, how was working with them? I think it was amazing. Like uh, the first time I met Alexi Laiho and Jaska Raatikainen, and they were like 14 or 15 year olds who came for uh, a demo recording, just the two of them. And I recall after the demo recording, uh, talking to myself, like it would be so cool to get to do this kind of music more. Because they, they, they just had, even at that young age, they had something very special uh, in them. And yeah, we, uh, they came for the next demo uh, session. The next one was the Shining demo. And then they had the whole band. And then uh, we record, recorded the first album. And then we started doing singles and albums and, and all that stuff. And I also toured with them for four years yeah, as a live sound engineer and drove the bus and uh, set up their instruments and was the tour manager from time to time. And yeah, it was very, very intense. I, I recall almost one year talking with Alexi Laiho every single day on the phone. And uh, yeah, it was it was pretty amazing. And um, especially uh, as they were a young band starting starting their career it was so cool to uh, be able to help them as even though i was almost we were almost the same age alexander was a little bit older but uh, i had been doing lots of studio work i've been doing lots of live shows so it was uh, kind of growing up with them but still with the experience i had i shared it all with them and like during the first year or so i was recording the live show when i was mixing it on on a cassette and after the show when we went back home we didn't have any money for hotels uh, so we we needed to always after the show go back back home uh, i played the tape immediately when we got to the car and we went through the whole show like you can't say that on stage or uh, it's too fast and uh, all these small things which a musician needs some guidance to to kind of uh, get on the right track and um, yeah it was uh, amazing times yeah and then thinking that they became uh, one of the most important band from finland uh, one of the most important band in the in the metal in the metal world so i think it was uh, it was great for you to to be part of this and to see them reaching the success that they deserved because I think there is no other band like Children of Bodom. They are one of a kind. Completely agree and it, it was amazing to kind of uh, especially I can only speak about the years when when I was touring with them but the guys were so down to earth and uh, all the time belittling about themselves like saying that oh we are we are nothing but just punk rockers from from espo and uh so the piece uh, did not go to the head because the guys were so down to earth and still a huge success was kind of already coming so it, it was very cool so to uh, see how how they stayed the same especially yeah. during those years yeah, I think it's uh, it's important that a band uh, stay down down on heart. Um, yes, 
if someone I have seen a musician getting uh, like thinking that they they are the best they they are uh, like God and it's not good because at some point they are going to fall and exactly it's going, to, going so bad I have seen a few and even if they they have the talent and they have the what what is what they need to get there if they are not down on earth then yeah it's not going to end well it's it's sad but it's true <laughs> yes completely agree yeah. and uh, what was the last band you worked with with i mean uh, the last band that came to record this year. The, the last session was with Tuomas uh, J.K. Turunen. We recorded his EP and uh, live acoustic EP and recording, mixing, mastering in less than two days. And uh, for example, the end of year is mostly spent on, on my side uh, doing different kind of projects. Like the beginning of this week, I was doing uh, monitors for my very good friend Mr. Hannu Lepola turned 50 years and he had this huge uh, live show spectacle, spectacle event in Lappeenranta Kulttuuritila Nuijamies and uh, he had 16 people performing and uh, I think they all were on stage at least on, on one song and uh, yeah, a whole Monday was spent on rehearsing something like 10 hours or so and uh, on Tuesday, we were rehearsing for eight hours, then there was a 30 minute break and then started uh, the live show and there were 22 songs and I was also actually playing acoustic guitar and singing on one song, even, even though I was doing the monitors at the same time and I, I, I had a huge monitor console and it was an uh, analog signal path monitor system and uh, we have a, a little bit different kind of projects going like we have developed a tube amplifier for audio files and that's what we've been working working on recently a lot and then also with that amplifier comes this little bit strange stuff like uh, when people have chronic pain uh, we can on most cases we can get rid of that chronic pain when we are listening to music using our the amplifier which we created which is kind okay. of Kind of amazing. <laughs> That's really interesting. Because you you can make a good album almost any time, but if you can improve some of someone's health or um, help help with coordination for the people who have problem with coordination or um, uh, help help to remove the chronic pain, that's something which we've been yeah. exploring a lot recently. You know, uh, I'm a physiotherapist, so working. A to help people with pain or with condition. It's uh, my every, every everyday task. Um, we had, uh, uh, I don't know, what, what was the name? There was like this cocoon things uh, and it helps with uh, mostly with people with maybe um, intellectual disability, mostly. Um, it's it's from Germany this thing, and we had just uh, rent from from Espo. Actually, uh, it arrived, or well, the speech therapist went to to Espo to to and bring it to to Pori, and uh, it's super interesting because you both, if for example it's me and you, and there is this cocoon in the middle of the table, we put the hand on the, the cocoon thing and uh, you can choose the kind of sound you want and then you are going to touch the other person hand or face or whatever and sounds kind come out and a different way if you do like this or if you keep or if you stroke so it was really beautiful and I think that it's amazing that uh, with sounds, with music, with vib vibration, you can achieve a lot. So, yeah. Yes. 
it's it's really interesting how many how many things you can use and uh, mm. yeah and uh, are you doing this uh, uh i mean uh, is this available only in Finland or is something that is around the world? Uh, at the moment, it's only available in uh, at Astia Studio. Okay. And uh, next year, we are hoping to release uh, kind of we are we are now working to get the amplifier in production. And uh, yeah, once we get it, uh, get it released to the public, then uh, we hope it will start spreading. And it, it's impossible to understand it by reading or by telling, but you need to experience. That's yeah. the only way to understand what's going on. And that's, I, I have a hunch that it's going to be quite huge. Yeah, I think so, because the chronic pain is a big thing in the world. So, and in Finland also, there are a lot of people that need something that can help, may help. So. I'm I'm looking forward to hear more about this project and uh, maybe maybe have the opportunity to try and and see how it works. Yeah. So let's talk about metal in general. Um, when did you start to listen to metal music or rock music? Um, I think I was. Uh in elementary school, maybe on third or fourth grade. And so how, how old, maybe, maybe 10, 10 or something, uh, 10, 11 years old. And my friend introduced me to Iron Maiden and uh, the Scorpions and the eighties kind of hard rock bands. And at the same time, Metallica, Anthrax, these, uh, yeah, the classic metal bands, Judas Priest, of course. And uh, at that time, I didn't like the more brutal metal uh, music, but I was more like may maybe the Judas Priest Turbo was was quite nice, or Iron Maiden Seventh Son of the Seventh Son, which is still still one of my most fa favorite albums ever. And yeah, gradually from there, uh, I, st I started experiment experimenting and exploring different genres and. I came to the realization that it doesn't matter which genre you listen, it's all, all about a good song. So a good song can be of any genre, but still metal music is close to my heart. I've been listening to metal music a lot, even, even though I work with metal musicians and still record a lot of metal. Uh, this week alone, I've been listening to King Diamond Conspiracy from cassette tape, for, I, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 times. Yeah. I think that uh, when you start to listen to metal, it just stay there. Even if you go go ahead with your life, and maybe you are listening also to other things, but you always get back to the to the origin. Let's say. Um, <laughs> yes. I I I didn't listen to metal when I was a kid because no one told me about metal uh, or maybe <laughs> i was listening something more uh, new metal something like this and then of course you knew the the classics uh, rocks and uh, then of course iron maiden but uh, then when i got introduced to metal then it just started and uh, I started with power metal and then I went to folk and progressive and uh, then I went to melodic death and uh, everything. So it's, as you said, it's about the, the song. If the song is good, if the song talks to your soul, that's it. It's love. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And it, it's so funny that in metal also, it's love. I, I completely agree. And uh, even though it can be as brutal a song as possible, but still, I, I think there is something very cool which kind of gets you rid of the bad emotions. Or uh, yeah. So the music is always a positive thing. Yeah, it's true. You can uh, um, set your mind free with music. Yes. So it's uh, and... it's uh, a relaxation way. And uh, for many, it may be weird that you are relaxing, listening to death metal or black metal, but 
yeah, why not? <laughs> I, I I just had a, a psy psychology doctorate visiting me, and she said that next time she comes to my place, she wants to listen to Slayer. I was like, that's cool. That's that's the kind of person I I like to work with, and. I recall when I started uh, working with Children of Boredom that um, I had to go through um, kind of a discussion with myself. Is it okay for me to be part in, in music where people shout like hate from the bottom of their heart and kind of the brutal stuff because I, I hadn't grown up with that kind of stuff. And I, I very vividly recall the moment when Children of Boredom received their first handwritten letter, uh, like uh, I was about to kill myself, but then your music saved me and prevented me from killing myself. And then they started getting dozens of them, hundreds of them, even like thousands of them. So that's when I thought that, uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can very much be a part of that kind of thing yeah. where you can get rid of all the bad emotion and you can help people, people with yeah. music yeah and music is a therapeutic yes <laughs> so it's it's such a beautiful thing i think that there is no world without music there, there is no life without music um, completely agree i i cannot see myself living without music it's such a big part and uh, every, every time, uh, you know, every time of your life is a certain uh, um, soundtrack. And uh, when you when you listen to a song, you kind of relieve on, you, you remember. And even if it's um, not always uh, everything nice, but it's, you remember with a smile. I, I don't I don't know sometimes I think oh yeah I remember this song I was so stupid back then because <laughs> something and <laughs> but it's it's a sweet memory I think it's a very very cool time machine yeah. and uh, when I was recording on the digital I did not listen to any music because I thought that once uh, your hobby becomes your profession then uh, it kind of uh, you you no longer have the emotional kind of connection to it and i accepted my faith for 15 years i didn't listen to any music outside the this this room uh, the astia studio a control room and uh, after discovering the analog signal path and what it can do uh, nowadays i listen to music approximately 15 hours a day when i have a band coming to uh, make a recording, mixing, mastering with me. We work 10 hours a day, but one hour before we start listening to music when we are having breakfast together. During the lunch break, we listen to music all the time from cassette or uh, vinyl record. And when we uh, finish for the day, uh, approximately eight o'clock in, in the evening, we go have a dinner and we are all the time listening to music and we usually listen until midnight. So yeah. it's approximately 15 hours. Actually, I, I knew that you, when you have the artist there, you used to listen to, uh, to cassette or vinyls, uh, vi vinyl. What's in English? Vinyl. Yeah, vinyl. vinyl. Vinyl record. Yeah, <laughs> and because you know, I did the the interview for last month with uh, Van Guardian, and they mentioned this uh, that uh, they they start to collect vinyls after. <laughs> they were uh, doing the record session with you that you you give them this uh, this uh, amazing things uh, to listen uh, vinyl again and yeah it's so so cool to kind of introduce vinyl records to people who haven't heard them or when, when it's about uh, older musicians that people who have already forgotten what a vinyl record can do yeah I think that nowadays uh, there are a lot of people that are buying vinyls and yeah it's uh, it's a beautiful thing because um with the digital system and uh, Spotify and so on it's not the same thing also you are not that much supporting the band exactly. I don't know what's your opinion with uh, Spotify I I listen to Spotify 
of course when I'm on the on the bus and I I like to have uh, my head uh, full with music uh, but at the same time I know that this is not the best thing it's you are not supporting any, anyone that much <laughs> so what's your opinion on, on on Spotify and things like this well um uh even the bands who who i work with and um, at the end of year when most bands are posting this many listener uh, people have been listening to our music this and this many hours I, I i don't want to be any part of that because i, I my personal opinion which i'm entitled to is that uh, it's one cause for the people to feel not very good at the moment and uh, to support but I just said uh, a couple of years ago we did as far as I know it's the world's first research about analog and digital audio uh, signal path audio and uh, we did re three month study with the third graders and sixth graders like young young people at school and uh, we played them nine minutes of music per day three three minutes in the morning three minutes after the lunch break and three minutes at the beginning of the first, uh, last uh, hour at school. And we had one month for analog signal path music, one month of silence and one month of digital signal path music. It's on my uh, the Finnish side of my blog. There is the re research report uh, available for anyone to read. And the final result was that both teachers who participate in the study they use the analog signal path music even today at, at their with, with their students every single day and they they told us that they want to be a part of our future studies but there is one thing which they will not do and they will not play even nine minutes of spotify music to the students so i think that speaks volumes yeah yeah true true yeah but uh talking about the live music now um what's the best uh concert that you have ever seen it's a very good question uh either steve Vai with his Vai band including devin townsend in helsinki in kulturi talo uh, early early 90s or maybe Iron Maiden on No Prayer for the Dying Tour, also early, early 90s. Then if, uh, if it can, uh, can include uh, shows that I've been mixing, then definitely Children of Boredom at Wacken in 2002 on the main stage after uh, Bruce Dickinson's solo gig. <laughs> the guys, guys were completely in flames. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, there is any band that you have seen live that was uh, not that good as you you thought of. You don't need to tell the bands, but is there any that was a disappointment? Uh, nowadays, yes, but then again, I, I have pretty strong opinions, and they all are based on years and years of uh, simple comparison. Um, personally, I, I don't go to many live shows nowadays. I, I will go if I know that there is analog signal path audio coming, like then it would be a completely acoustic show or uh, in in specific place where there is no digital mixing consoles so that I can be sure that there is 100% of the information that audio and music has can be given to the listeners. Then then I, then I will go there. But nowadays, even the band can be quite good, but they are kind of diminished to uh, a smaller degree. Uh, so that makes them sound not so good yeah. on many occasions, unfortunately. Yeah. But let's go to the question. There was a question on Instagram for you. Let's see if my phone is working. <laughs> Maybe, maybe. Here we are. Let's get to the to the question. So here we are. 
So, comments. It's a bit slow. <laughs> Maybe I should buy a new one, <laughs> but not today. Uh, so, there is uh, Tuomas Heikinen that uh, ask, does keeping a fully analog studio working require a lot of time fixing the equipment? How hard it is to source parts, find service manuals, etc. Et Big fan. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, yes, it takes a lot longer. Uh, kind of, uh, if, if I would use uh, software, it would be in in a way faster. Kind of, but now now I need to do a lot of maintenance. I need to do sometimes some fixing to fix the broken uh, machinery. But then again. The old equipment which I use, the oldest ones which I have are from the 50s, 1950s, which is kind of cool. Uh, and I think the newest ones which I'm using are early 2000s or maybe 90s, uh, built in, in that era. And as they are man-made, especially the 50s and 60s, 70s equipment, then a man can easily repair it. So the mixing console behind me, I've changed almost 9,000 uh capacitors to the console so i have no um uh, i have not been studying any any electrician stuff but I, i'm just self-learned and i i know how to fix most of this stuff and even though it takes a little bit longer when it comes to maintenance it's definitely worth it and about the uh, service man manuals and such internet has most of them and also maybe 50 percent of the service manuals i've received along with the equipment itself so it's it's cool that when you have an old tape machine that it you you get not only the tape machine but also a huge manual and then a huge service manual which has all the parts and how, how you can tear it down and then put it <laughs> together again I think it's really interesting because uh, it's uh, an ongo ongoing process of learning also for you, even if you have been doing this for many, many years, but you are never going to stop learning because there is always something new. So it's uh, it's an amazing thing. Definitely. And I, I feel that I've just scratched the surface of audio and sound, even though it's been 30 years of uh, uh, studying and trying to understand what it's all about yeah but it's uh it's everything is in you when you want to learn when you want to get that something more then you you get deeper and deeper so it's uh it's the curiosity it's the passion that may that makes the everything let's say perfect even if perfection doesn't exist but <laughs> to go go towards it and uh, like it would be easy for me to write blog posts about microphone position or or something uh, the kind of the basic stuff but personally uh, personally i like much more the idea of uh getting the body resonance how to make it more strong and uh, and that's too strange to write about so that's why uh, i haven't been writing uh, posting a lot recently on the blog because i've been doing more research and experimenting and found some very very cool cool stuff which uh, would be most likely against the mainstream but then again all my life i've been going against the mainstream and i'm i i, I go towards what i think and feel is the best yeah that's that's the the best thing be real to yourself yes yeah but let's go to my jar let's see <laughs> what topics are we going to talk about let's see i feel like this this one seems good movies uh, so cool are you a I big movies. Uh, movie okay so you love movies what's your favorite movie uh, I can't say maybe one favorite movie. There, there are definitely several. Uh, for example, Top Secret, the Zucker, Abraham's Zucker trio's uh, uh, comedy from the 80s. That's definitely one of my favorites. Also, their TV series Police Squad. Uh, I, mean, I have it on VHS. And um, Christoph Kieslowski's uh, Color Trilogy, Blue 
is awesome. Uh, any David Lynch movie, especially the older ones, I completely love. And yeah, I, I, I do my best to watch movies as often as possible. And back in the days, for example, with Children of Boredom, uh, we were watching movies almost on, on a daily basis. And uh, if I recall correctly, when they were recording uh, the Shining demo at the second location of Astia Studio in the center of Lappenranta, uh, that's where they started watching Amadeus, the eight Oscar uh, winner, uh, awesome, Sorry. awesome Milos Forman movie. And uh, then on the next album, we could hear the uh, results. Of course, guys were watching it at home as well, because when, when you find a good movie, you need to watch it many times. Yeah, I think that Amadeus is such a great movie that uh, everyone should watch if yes. they didn't watch because i remember i watched as a as a kid i think i was 11 or 12 and yeah i felt in love it was it's one of the the biggest uh, and i still remember part if even if it's been a while may, maybe i should watch it yeah and <laughs> definitely uh, should do, do you I'm, like uh... yeah say go ahead and please, if, if you're going to watch it, watch it from VHS tape, please. I was going to ask you, uh, how do you watch the movies? So, from from VHS tapes, uh, usually when when a band enters Astia Studio for the first time, and at the kind of entrance lobby, there is a big bookshelf full of VHS cassettes, and people people usually point them and laugh. When we go check the living room, uh, I also live in uh, at Astia Studio in the same building. When we go to the living room, there is even more VHS cassettes. And how many, then, how many do you own? Uh, two and a half thousand, maybe three thousand at the moment. Mm -hmm. And Great collection. yeah, thank you very much. I've, I've done my best to get all the kind of classic movies on VHS, and yeah. Uh, we just kind of uh, first they laugh at it and when I show them the difference using a simple A-B comparison then ev without any exception every every musician is completely blown away and they usually like I don't know if you ask one guardian they are also watching VHS movies and collecting them because uh, yeah they were bitten by the same same analog bug I you know I grew up watching uh, VHS so it's uh, you know what i'm yeah, talking about it's it, it's like uh, there was the vhs the, there was a listening music with cassette and the thing that uh, i think everyone was doing at some point listening to the radio and waiting for the right moment to record the <laughs> the song that was coming but yeah i i don't know if if i still have something in it I don't know because uh, we were kind of wild kids, uh, me, my brother, and my sister. In particular, my sister was able to rip everything. Uh, I was uh, able to broke everything, like uh, every ev everything that was uh, more expensive. But my sister was with the VHS. I, I don't know why she was like ripping them off. So I don't know if there is still something. <laughs> She, but, she yeah. wanted to see where the uh, audio and uh, the picture was because when I was a kid, my mom bought me a drum and she told me that I love to play play the drum, but it didn't take long that I opened the drum because I wanted to see what makes the sound. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that the, for many kids, it's like you have to open to um, to see what, how, how does it work, what's it, what it is. But yeah, it's... It's something beautiful, but let's take another one. Let's see what we are going to get. One from the middle here. And then we go with art. So what kind of uh, art beside music and movies? What kind of art do you like? Uh, I've been visiting a couple of uh, kind of art galleries. And I, I know it sounds boring, this kind of stuff, because you, you can you can watch it online as well, but it's not the same. And um, for example, Emil Wikström's uh, 
artist home. I don't know how, how to say it. He, he's the person who uh, created the stone statues on Helsinki railway station, the, the, those lamp, yeah. lamp, oh, lantern holders. And uh, I completely love his, uh, what, what he's done. I like the statues when you go there and it feels like the statue is looking at you and not, not only on the surface of you, but like we, to your soul. And then when you move to the next piece, the uh, statue next to you is still looking at you. So it's kind of, kind of, um, uh, how, how is it done? That's so cool. Or uh, at, at, in Lapland, in Levi, there is uh, Reidar Sarestoniemi, the similar kind of his, his uh, home and his art is put there uh, on display. And I, I checked a couple of uh, his paintings online and I was like, yeah, okay, he has, he has some good topics. W when I stood in front of the painting, it was like, I could not move. It was some, something was flowing from that painting, which I had not experienced earlier. And I was glued there for, I just stood like 15 minutes and it was a huge amount of emotion. And this is also impossible to understand. Uh, uh, in any other way than to experience it. So, yeah, statues, uh, paintings, I, I think they have a lot in common with mo movies and with music because the artist puts their focus, their, their energy in, into it and they, they create some kind of cool being. And uh, if you are sensitive enough, you can, you can sense it. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, Some... I, I'm a I'm a I'm a big fan of a museum. So if I can, I go to see museum. I go if I'm somewhere, I'm going to see churches because there is uh, amazing art. And yeah, I'm from Italy, so the art from the past is is big. But even before moving to Finland, when I was coming to holidays to Finland, I was always going, for example, if I was in a, in Helsinki, I was going to Ateneum, I was going to Kiasma, I was going to see all the churches, all the all the all the, the things uh, and uh, talking about uh, art. Uh, uh, I remember at school uh, when I was a teenager, I think around when we were uh, 12 or 13, something like this. Um, I remember that we were studying art. We had art class and uh, I remember uh, watching uh, the Botticelli uh, paintings. And then uh, uh, we went to Florence uh, and we went to Uffiz Uffizi Muse Museum and uh, watching those art pieces there. It was like, wow. And uh, still, I, I I love, I love to go and watch art pieces, and uh, I don't know I don't know if I have a, a style that I prefer because uh, there there are there are a lot of styles that I I really enjoy. I remember at some point I was so much into Monet, <laughs> and I is kind of uh, but. Uh, I remember going to Amsterdam to the Van Gogh Museum and be amazed about his uh, art pieces. And uh, but also nowadays uh, going to smaller Empori, if some art artists do some some show, and I go, I'm going and watch, and they are beautiful. It's uh, it's beautiful how how a person can uh, can exprim with uh, true colors or uh, shapes and so on. That's do so you true. Have, yeah. Do you have any particular uh, art style that you enjoy most or, or not? Uh, actually, I, I've been trying to uh, figure out if there is such style. And I, I've come to the conclusion that there is no specific style for me. I, I think... Um, Every style can, it, it always depends on the artist itself, how huge, I don't know what, what, what you call it, what, what it is that the artist creates other than just like what you see with your eye. There is some, some extra element to it and some artists can create a stronger one and some artists creates not so strong one. So it's kind of doesn't depend on style. And I think it, it's the same with music as well. You, you, you can play E minor, C, D, and you have basically most of Iron Maiden songs there. But then again, uh, some musician 
can add something, some extra element to it, which kind of gives you the goosebumps, even though it's the same, exactly the same ingredients there. So yeah. that's what I'm more, more interested in, in art pieces as well. If it's a painting that some person can create something more than the eye can see. Yeah. Are you able to paint or uh, doing other kind of art uh, beside music? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I uh, only only kind of working with sound, but that's that's only art for what I can create. But it's a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, I I would like to be able, but sometimes I have my art attack. I I call always uh, I have my art attack, and I try to do something up. Uh, I'm into photography mostly. I do gigs photography, but it's digital. But maybe one day I I can get to the to the old way. <laughs> but St strongly recommend, and if you do, uh, try to develop the pictures by yourself, and then you can kind of keep the signal path analog all the way. I guarantee that you will be surprised. Uh, two recording engineers when they visited me they have quit uh, recording on the digital and they have gone the analog way as well as they've understood the same principles that I have understood. And also one photographer who visited me and he went home and he started experimenting and he told me that he doesn't want to do any digital photo shoot anymore. He wants to do only on the film. And even yeah. though if you have to kind of digitize it in the end, it's the same as, as with music. You can hear the difference once you know what to concentrate on. And same with movies. Most movies nowadays are shot on film and it costs like $350,000 uh, more to shoot the movie on the film. And then eventually it still will be digitized. But there is the benefit that they are willing to invest yeah, 3,500,000. Yeah. 3, uh, uh, so it's the same, same in pictures and in yeah, audio. In everything, yeah. Yeah, I will. I will uh, take it, but at some point, uh, money are needed for everything. <laughs> but <laughs> let's see. I will. I will let you know. I will let you know when uh, when I t I start to experiment. But um, let's go. Going to talk about the most important thing, pizza. So yes, do you like pizza? <laughs> I love pizza. What's your favorite pizza? Um. We've had some very good pizza places in La Peranta. I've also uh, been to Italy many times and eaten have, have an awesome good pizza there. At the moment, my most favorite pizza is completely homemade. Homemade with uh, luomu, which means organic ingredients, which means that there is no pesticides or any, any, any that kind of stuff. So it's good for the body. And uh, what there would be, there would be what is it called? Um, yeah, well, with vegetables anyway. No, no meat usually. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And uh, where did you eat the best pizza ever? If you if you think about all the places that you have been eating pizza, there is one place that uh, that was like the the top. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I know it's going to be very boring, but I have to say at home, because uh, me and my girlfriend like to make very good food and we, we, we go to a, an expensive restaurant and we eat there and then we come home and we do our best to create the same taste at home, which I, I think is very cool. And uh, like, for example, if you make a soup, especially some vegetable soup, you should first put the ingredients in the oven and kind of, uh, because that adds to the taste a huge amount so yeah uh, at, at home many many people like for example mr tony pananen famous finnish drummer he has been eating new york pizza as well he was blown away when we made pizza here at one recording session and, and he confessed very silently but he still confessed that this is even better than the uh, new york pizza <laughs> which was music nice. to my ears yeah so you can be proud of <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah when, when you have the correct ingredients you don't need to do uh, magic it's a, I, I think 
in audio work and in uh, uh, cooking, they, they are very similar. And you, you can put uh, like the grilling ingredients or, or, or whatnot. You can put, put huge amount of stuff like use the five band compressors or whatever you want. But in the end, when you, when you have good ingredients, all you need is salt and pepper. That's like, you don't need anything else to add. And it's, it's kind of like the same with music. You don't, you don't need to do a lot of gimmicks. When you get the basic elements correct, then it, all you need to do is like, uh, just touch of this here and there and nothing special. That's true. That's true. And uh, where did you eat the worst pizza? <laughs> Most Finnish, uh, I don't know, the so-called pizzerias, where the ingredients are the opposite of organic. And I, I can't think of any, any, any specific pizza place, but we, uh, I used to do a lot of live shows and I, I used to tour all, all across the Finland and all across the world. And usually like the cheapest pizza was not the best pizza. <laughs> now let's go to the, to the question. Does yes. maple belong to pizza? Uh, sorry, can you please ask again? Does da, does pineapple belong to pizza? Pineapple, uh, it can belong to pizza. Uh, sometimes I I like to add pineapple to pizza, but sometimes definitely no. So it depends on the mood, and sometimes it's the best thing on pizza, but sometimes it's definite no no. So maybe a boring well, answer. You are but... team uh, pineapple on pizza. <laughs> Uh, 50% of time. Okay. And uh, do, do you use, uh, because you, you say you use uh, this uh, uh, Uomo uh, ingredients. ingredients. So do you take the the whole ananas thing uh, or do you take the, the, the box when you, when you do it? Sometimes the box, as they have also the box is organic. But uh, sometimes the whole whole uh, pineapple, whole ananas. And uh, I, I have to mention, I don't know if you know about this, but um, at some point when I was touring with Children of Bodom, we were laughing that we have the uh, rider. When you go backstage, there are there is certain foods and drinks and whatnot waiting. So I recall uh, Alex Eli was laughing that maybe we should add some extinct animal to the rider. And we were uh, t t talking about uh, adding platypus on the rider so that we go to a live show and then we go to backstage and we are like, hey, where's the platypus? What platypus? Well, well you signed the contract. We, we, need, we need to have a platypus. But uh, then we decided that that might be too much and we, we might not be able to do many live shows after that. So we replaced the platypus with a full pineapple, a full ananas, like the kind of the uh not can't version and i recall when we played at tuska festival some some year I, I can't recall which year and we went to backstage and there was the kind of backstage manager coming to us like are you serious you want to have a p full pineapple in the, in backstage we're like yep yeah, it's in the, in the rider get it and, uh, and she was like why we're like it's in the rider we need it uh, so she went to the shop and got it to us and uh, we always took the pineapple and we placed it on jaska's bass drum and at some Tuska, maybe maybe some viewers have photos from an old Children of Burm Tuska show. There is a pineapple uh, sitting on Jaska's bass drum. And after the show, we usually ate it. <laughs> nice. That was a nice story. <laughs> Thanks. But uh, we are at the end of this interview. So thank you so much for your time. It was really a pleasure. And I hope thank you have the opportunity to do it again in the future. Um, I hope so. Thank you very much. Do, do you like to say something to people that are listening, watching this interview? Um, I uh, Let's take a challenge. I challenge you to take an analog signal path vinyl record or a cassette tape and compare that to Spotify. A-B comparison. Very simple. Don't use uh, new uh, active speakers which have the DSP, digital signal processing, uh, bypass all digital signal processing 
and do a comparison. I'm 100% sure that you will be very pleasantly surprised. Kiitos. <laughs> Thank you very much.